The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Welcome to the Stoa. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. And for those of you who don't know, the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And today we have a special Sunday event, um, the title, Dying East and West with Daniel P. Brown. Um, so this is a 90 minute session. Uh, it's recorded and it will go on YouTube. Uh, and the MC for the day is a humble human being, as that's how he wanted to be known by, uh, Cody Taff. Uh, I'll hand it to Cody in a moment. He'll introduce Daniel, introduce how the session is going to run today, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So that being said, I will take Daniel in. You can unmute yourself now. Hey, Daniel. Um, Hi. Okay, so uh, Daniel, if you don't mind, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna dote on you for a second, um, since I don't think um, I don't think everyone knows who you are. So, Daniel's um, Dr. Daniel P. Brown um, is a director of uh, Center of Inter Integrative um, Psychotherapy in Newton, Massachusetts, associate clinical professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. Medical School. The author of 15 books, including Transformations of Consciousness with Ken Wilber and Jack Engler. Um, he studied meditation practice for 45 years, beginning with reading Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and its commentaries in their original Sanskrit. Studied Tibetan for, um, for many years. Uh, translated uh, texts for 10 years. He can speak to this and, and the task that he was given to translate 11 different texts. And I think he just finished up on that. Um, as a Western psychologist, he spent 10 years conducting outcomes research on beginning and advanced meditators, taught meditation retreats for 20 years, and the list goes on and on. Um, so welcome, Daniel. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, and I want to just uh, set the setting of how this, um, how this event came to be. Um, a few uh, Stoites um, and I threw a little private session to kind of get a vibe of what was going on in the Stoa and maybe get a sense of what the Stoa wanted as an essence. Um, and it was a fun little event. And what showed up was something around dying and, and, and mortality and existence in general. And it was really beautiful. And one thing that came up was the idea that we're in the middle of this pandemic and hundreds of thousands of people have died. Many of them have died alone. Um, this, uh, you know, hearing that, I was reminded of actually Daniel speaking to this very thing. Um, and I was reminded of a grieving practice that, um, that he knows. At the same time, and why this is so important is because we haven't dealt with this in any way. New York Times put out a list of, you know, people that died in the middle of this. And I think that's about all that the media or leadership has actually done in a form of, of grieving a, a time like this with such loss and uh, loneliness. And at the same time, that speaks a little bit to leadership. Um, that speaks to a little bit of lack, a lot of bit of lack of leadership. And I think the STOA actually really attracts a lot of, uh, a lot of individuals that, that may have that in them. You know, they're having these conversations that are actually very hard and that, that these conversations are what, uh, what makes leaders. And in that, I'm reminded of uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger saying, you know, we have the power of gods right now as humanity, but we don't have the wisdom to wield that. And in that, I'm... I'm, I'm reminded and, and, and question, what are, the, what, are, what are the paths and the tools that we can actually gain that wisdom? And we have mindfulness uh, you know, running rampant and meditation techniques running rampant in the West, but Daniel's a part of a lineage that's something very special and, it, and, it, uh, and he's gonna speak to this, um, that has a goal of awakening. And, and, and perhaps that goal can, and these practices can lead us to uh, awakened leaders and uh, with Buddhas in the West, so. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to let you take this, and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the Western approaches to dying and grieving process first, and then I'm going to talk about the, the approaches in Tibetan Buddhism. So from a Western perspective, the, grieving is a natural process to, to the loss of someone. So when someone dies, we, we first go through a stage of disbelief, and we don't really get it that the person has died. We don't, we don't accept it. We want to deny it. 
So we push out the memories and the feelings of the person. And then they alternate between coming back to us and then we work back and forth between denying the feelings and memories and having the experience of them. And over time, we eventually work it out and, this, and, the, and the grieving process comes to a close. That's the normal grieving process. But for the last 100 years, we've, through, mainly through the psychoanalytic tradition, we've, just, we've looked at the grieving process in great detail. And what we know is that some people don't go through the normal grieving process. It doesn't end. We call that complicated mourning. And what complicates the grieving process is usually conflict. So the relationships that we're closest to and we're the least conflictual are the ones that are easiest to mourn. But the ones that we're more conflicted about are the ones that are hardest to mourn. And I've um, been interested particularly in grieving. And some 20 years ago, I found a grieving protocol that was developed in Australia in the 1980s. It was an obscure journal of hypnosis in, in Australia. And what it described was 63 cases of complicated bereavement that were resolved completely in, in less than three sessions. The average time was one to two sessions and the maximum was three sessions. That raised my eyebrows. So we looked at the protocol and as was often in, in that generation, people described in general what they did, but they didn't describe in great detail what they did. So we, didn't, we couldn't extract the, the method easily from the text that was written about it. So we put it into process as well as we could and we, we used it for over 200 people and I found the same results that we had a complete resolution of complicated mourning in less than three sessions each time, over 200 sessions. So that amazed me. So this became very popular over time and we sort of filled it out to the mainstream. I, I started teaching grief workshops around the country and then uh, internationally. And uh, it became a very popular way of dealing with the grieving process. I will do that method with you at the end of this talk, it, 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 before we get to the question and answer, we'll actually go through it. So your task is to think about some loss that you never really fight, got over. And we'll, we'll go through it as a process. As a, as a, you can do it on somebody individually that you, it can, doesn't have to be lost through dying. It can be also a relationship you never quite got over that the person's still, still alive, but they, it's still a loss. So you can use it either way. Let me turn now to, we'll come back to this exercise. I'll do it for you. The best way of doing it is just do it. It's very powerful. But I want to come back to the Western, the Eastern approach to, to dying. And in Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, there's a series of methods called consciousness transfers, POA. The word literally means to shift location. And that's the, the method I'm going to talk about now. These represent lineage traditions. And a lineage means that there are special instructions and the emphasis on lineage traditions is to focus on the actual experience of an awakened mind, shifting from an ordinary mind to awakened mind. And you're given detailed instructions, which are usually kept secret, so you don't intellectualize about them. They're given from master to student, from heart to heart. We call, we'll call them special pith instructions. They're given from master to student, from heart to heart, from generation to generation. And they describe exactly how to look at the, take a certain perspective or view sets up your meditation experience so you can actually have the experience of awakening. And there are fifth instructions for every level of practice from the beginning of the practice to dismantling the structures of the mind to having the taste of awakening to working through all negative states and developing the flourishing positive states and then there's a special set of fifth instructions for full enlightenment. So each, each set of fifth instructions is like a key that opens up a gateway to a whole level of practice in lineage traditions. And the, the mindfulness is very popular in the West. And I did outcome studies as a Western psychologist on mindfulness for 10 years. But I think what's happened is it's become commercialized, is that it's forgotten its roots. Uh, I say that as someone who knows this tradition well. I, in the 1970s, I went to Burma, had a special visa. As Western as we only had a week's long visa, but Mahasi Sayadaw, the great teacher in Burma, came to the U.S. and I did a course with him. And I invited him to Harvard to give a talk on mindfulness meditation. And while he was at the, after he finished the talk, he was, I was having lunch with him and he said, come to Burma. I said, well, that's all good and well, but I can't come to Burma because I only get a week's visa. He said, no, I get a special visa for you. So my visa was that as long as I meditated, I could stay in the country. But as soon as I stopped meditating, I had to leave. So I stayed for about four months. 
and went through all the stages of the practice with him and including a taste of awakening in that tradition but as it's got more popular and mindfulness has become just a way of becoming aware it's ordinary awareness so the tr people are training con the continuity of ordinary awareness and that's different from awakened awareness and so in lineage traditions the whole emphasis is on awakening we say that awakening is the confluence of all the teachings if it doesn't lead to that then you're not doing it right and then you refine the awakening so you have it all the time in all situations we have the only western neurocircuitry study on awakened mind we did a study last year with judd brewer when he was at umass medical school he's now at brown and sponsored by the fetzer foundation and i gave them 30 subjects who had a taste of awakening and we scanned them and and looked at what the brain was doing when they shifted from ordinary mind to awakened mind and what we found was very unusual there's an area of the parietal system that shifts from ordinary awareness to a more global huge awareness so this is like big perspective taking and that area of the brain got activated but what we saw in all 29 subjects was gamma activity that is the maximum output that means all the cells in that region of interest are all firing simultaneously at once so awake means awake it's a very specific finding if you stabilize awakening then you have it all the time you live in that state all the time and then you can set up a point of view that you can uh, start eradicating all karmic memory traces by holding a certain meditation practice and it takes about eight years to do that and what happens is you exhaust all negative ne negative states and you negative states mass the positive states so there's a flourishing of 80 positive states of mind that come out all at once just like that imagine living in a state of mind where there are no negative states in your experience the left and only positive states i happen to think that state of what's called sangha in tibetan has profound implications for mental health and we now have enough subjects who can do that so we're starting to look at the sonora circuitry of that and i think what we're going to find is a uh, dm activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex which is the positivity center of the brain and the social connection center of the brain and compassion center of the brain that's our working hypothesis gamma activity in that area of the brain so that's the unique contribution of lineage traditions they focus on the actual experience of awakening and refining of that to full enlightenment and they give you special detailed pith instructions to help open that up i'm going to talk about the lineage tradition more specifically today about the dying process and it's the, the, the set of exercises are called consciousness transference and there are four perspectives on that that i'm going to go through just briefly the first is what's called external consciousness transference the second is internal consciousness transference the third is secret and the fourth is very secret i want to give you an overview of each of those practices external consciousness transference a poor you do while you after you finish your hundred thousand preliminaries in tibetan buddhism it takes about two to two weeks to four weeks to do it and what you do is you imagine a a, a seed um, an energy drop about the size of a quarter about this big you place it in the central channel the central channel goes from the what we call the juncture which is four fingers below the navel it runs along the front of the spine and goes straight up to the crown so what you do is you place the 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 energy drop in the upper part of the central channel just above the heart and what you do is you 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 imagine pushing it up the central channel to widen the central channel the upper part of the central channel and you make a sound <laughs> And eventually the you open up that central channel the upper central channel in such a way that it hits the crown of your head and you can keep forcing that energy drop up and after about two weeks what happens is that you you move the crown plates and it makes a hole and that will be accompanied usually by the leaking of fluid and a swelling of this little swelling that happens in here and that at that point you go to the teacher those are called signs of progress talk signs of progress and then you'll take a straw from a broom and you'll put it right into the skin and it goes right into this it goes right because you move the plates out of the way so you've opened up the upper part of the central channel and then what you do is you plug it with a seed syllable you, you plug the hole and you go out and you live the rest of your life at some point when the process of dying what you do is you it's like an ejection seat in a jet fight fighter what you do is you 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 blow the 
the indestructible essence in at the at the point of conception there's an indestructible essence it's like a computer chip that has all the memories of your previous lives and you it's it's lodged in your heart at, at conception and when you die the chakra knots loosen and that that indestructible essence is freed up and floats in the central channel and what you do is you you when you when you see the signs of dying you 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 enter into meditation and you you blow it out the top of your head and if you blow it out that you, you come you come out any different orifice you come out your ears you can come out your mouth you can come out your ass you can come out anywhere but none of those will lead to a good birth unless you blow out the crown and if you have voluntary control over that process of transition of that indestructible essence it goes directly to what we call the awakened dharmakaya space and it, you, you 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 become a full buddha then you can intentionally manifest any form you want in any multiple forms even so that's what power is used as a backup so if you don't become buddha during a lifetime and you fail at the practices and meditation you're doing during your lifetime, the backup plan is that when you have external power, you can leave your consciousness when you leave the body and, and force it out the body through the crown and it immediately becomes awakened Dhammakaya space. That's external power. Now, there's a controversy in the tradition about external power. And that is that in the one of the books that I translated in the Bond tradition, called the Final Stages: The Practical Guide to the Stage of Ah, which is the 14 stages from beginning of practice all the way through full enlightenment in 14 lessons. It's sort of like the quick managed care version of enlightenment. We translated that, but there's a 14 sessions in some, and there's 15 sessions in another, and there's a debate about whether they should include the power practice in it. And the dominant consensus was that not to include it because you undermine people's confidence by giving them poor practice as a backup plan. Put the emphasis on having them become fully a Buddha during lifetime. And then if they don't do it, then you give the backup plan later in life, the external power. And that's the way that the tradition usually does it. Internal power is how you use the dying process itself during the actual dying process to become a Buddha. And there are three stages of the dying process. The well, first is called the chiki bardo, which is literally means the 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 time the, the dying process itself. It literally means the, the it, it, in the jaws of death while you're in the early stages of dying. And that's the best opportunity to become a full Buddha, if not during your lifetime. And that's called internal poa. And if you don't miss it, then the second bardo is called the bardo of of dhammadatu, chirni bardo. And the third is the bardo of rebirth. And the first is that when in internal power, the first opportunity, there are three opportunities you get. The first opportunity is during the jaws of dying. So what will happen is that the elements of the body dissolve and the elements of the body support the mind. So all conceptual thought stops, all perception stops. So if you open your eyes, you don't see anything anymore. You don't hear anything anymore. And what's left is an infinite field of lucid, awakened awareness. If you recognize that for what it is, we call that the clear light of the dying process. During that time when all thoughts and the percept ordinary perception stops, which would ordinary serve as a distraction to you, if you recognize that clear, lucid, bright, awakened awareness as, as awakened awareness, then you become a Buddha on the spot. So the best preparation for dying is awakening during the lifetime. So you can use what's called the clear light of dying to recognize and say, this is familiar, I know this. That's called, that's the first chance you get. If you miss that chance, then there's a second after death state called the bardo of Dhammadatu. And I like to call it the sound and light show. You get pairs of lights, one's bright and one's very bright and the other one's faint and light. And in the background, there are sounds like the continuous sound of thunderclap. It's very loud sounds. And you can use the sounds and lights to see through them as insubstantial, not, not as, as real, real substantial, not, not like a reality out there. You have to see it as, as just in mental constructions. The mind is throwing up these mental constructions. And if you see them properly as mental constructions and don't get caught up in them or react to them, then you can use that as a platform to 
see beyond those constructions to the clear light of awakened mind again. So that's the second, you can use the sound and light show. If you miss that, then what happens is the content starts to come back. And depending on the karmic influences of your lifetime, it was gonna determine which, which form of the six realms of existence, whether you're gonna come back as a human, whether you're gonna come back as a god, as a demigod, as a animal, as a hungry ghost, or as a hell world being, depending on how you lived your life and what the karmic influences are. And what happens is that the early in that, what's called the churny bardo, the, the bardo of, of possibility of, of rebirth. What happens in that bardo is that you, you, you have a mental body and your senses are back. You can hear people in, who, after you've died in that third bardo, the third after death state. You can see people who have survived your death, but they don't, they don't respond to you. If you talk to them, they don't respond to you. So at some point you figure out that you're dead. You don't know that right away, but anything the mind focuses on, if you thought about going to some place, just like that, you, you're immediately there. You say, whoa, that's amazing. So you infer from all of those things that are magical abilities that you probably are dead now. And that people can't respond to you anymore. They still have an influence on you. For example, if relatives pray for you, they can have a positive influence. They can calm your mind state. If your master prays for you, they can have an influence. So the idea is you have three chances in that process of what's called internal consciousness transference to become a Buddha. First is during the process of dying when all the content of the mind stops and you can recognize that infinite, vast, lucid field of awareness as awakened awareness. Or you can recognize the sound and light show as just empty visions like rainbow light in the sky, insubstantial yet occurring vividly. Or you can recognize the content that comes up and, and that's harder to recognize the content because it's like this lifetime. You have three chances, each one with progressively different, slightly different odds, less odds to become fully enlightened again. If you miss those opportunities, you get reborn again and you have to start over again. Now, there's a third one called secret power, and that's very rare. And let's suppose somebody dies of suicide, or they die suddenly and they didn't have a chance, they died tragically of sudden accident. There are certain lamas who know something about it, what, to do, what they'll do is they'll, they'll grab that indestructible essence out of the air like a cell phone number. They know how to grab it with sound. And then they'll, shh, shh, shh. they'll soothe it and comfort it. And then they will do, they'll compel it into Dhammakaya space. So a great Lama who knows this secret power practice can actually take somebody who's died and who would probably have a bad rebirth because, because they, they suicided or something like that, or somebody would get a tragic accident and a bad circumstances of their death, who would obviously be covered by an enormous amount of fear when they're dying. Out of compassion, they can take this indestructible essence, clean it off, and populate it in awakened Dhammakaya space. It's a great gift to give that to somebody and there are very few lamas who know that. And one, one of the lamas who I taught with, Rahab Tuku, who was actually my roommate in the 1980s. And he's the emanation of Padmasambhava. I didn't know that at the time when he was with my roommate. But he's the great master of Buddhism. He just died this last year. But he's, his monastery in Sichuan, China, does this special secret power. So we've sent him a number of people who, who we, over the years who he did that with. And the fourth is called Very Secret Power. And this is what's known as rainbow body. So great masters can, when they die, they can actually use the dying process to dissolve the physical body. And there are four practices that are done to develop what's called great consciousness transference or rainbow body. The first one is, the first two are what are called trekcho or thoroughly cutting through practices in Dzogchen. And the second ones are what are called 
bypassing. We work with four levels of visions. Those are the more advanced practices. What you do in the first practice is that you, once you have a taste of awakening, which is an infinitely vast field of limitless, timeless, boundless, brilliantly lucid, awakened awareness love, and you operate out of being that, that's your basis. It's, it's, it's non-localized. It's stunningly bright and lucid and clear, awake, sacred, and loving. That's the awakened mind. And in this practice, what you learn to do is when you first have that experience, it changes everything. It moves your heart. You, you feel like it's familiar to you. You recognize that you're coming home. And it changes everything in your life. But you'll probably fall out of that view. It, the ordinary habits of the mind come back. So you have to then set up that view to stabilize awakening on the pillow first. So what you do on the pillow is you set up the view that opens up this shift to ordinary mind, to awakened mind. You set it up so you experience it frequently for longer duration and more and more immediately. And the sign of progress you're looking for is that on the pillow, whenever you set up the view, you don't have to go through all the steps. It was an ordinary shift from ordinary mind to awakened mind. It will happen quickly and immediately. Once that happens and you on the pillow, you shift to awakening, you get off the pillow and you start engaging in activities. It's easy to maintain awakening when you're out in nature by yourself. But it's much harder to stabilize awakening when you're talking and conversing with somebody or when you are working on your computer. When I worked with my, 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 the best teacher I had was His Holiness Men Retrieving, the indigenous lineage holder for the bond for the last 10 years. He died a year ago. But he was the best teacher I ever had. I've worked with the Tibetan tradition for 50 years now. But um, when I first went to him, I could get a taste of awakening at the end of a 10 day retreat pretty regularly after 40 years of practice. He said, come to me, I can help you with this. So I went and spent a month with him and all he had to do was sit out in his office and he had a steady stream of people and I'd have to converse with them and maintain awakening while I was conversing with them. And I'd have to work on my computer and translate and while I was thinking, I had to maintain awakening. And after about a month, I could pretty much hold the awakening all the time, including in deep sleep and dreams. So that's the, after, if you hold awakening all the time, then you you hold that vast expanse as your view and it's limitless expanse of timeless awareness and you let everything arise within it and whatever arises within that you see as the lively expression of awakened awareness so all thoughts become lively awakened awareness all pers all emotions become lively awakened awareness all sights all sounds the body the body sensations become lively awakened awareness it's an uninterrupted dance of lively awakened awareness and then you hold both views simultaneously, the infinite vast expanse and the uninterrupted liveliness of what arises within that expanse. And you hold it in such a way that you don't engage anything that comes up. Mental engagement in Dzogchen or great, great completion meditations is what causes, what causes karmic memory traces to form. So if you hold this view and you let everything arise and you don't engage anything moment by moment by moment by moment, it forces the mind to release karmic memory traces. If you do that, it, after it becomes an automatic process. You do it 24-7. And, and after a while, after about seven or eight years, there's no negative states left. It's called Dhammadatta exhaustion. You exhaust all the negative states that would otherwise comically ripen. And since the negative states amass the positive states, you get a flourishing of 80 to 85 positive qualities at once. And that's the state of mind that you live in from there. So that process is... What you start with in, in when you do great consciousness transfer, it's very secret power. During the, if you do that process in, 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 in your meditations during your lifetime and you have some of the experience of what's called complete purification and the flourishing of positive states, what's called Sangha in Tibetan, then while you're dying and you read the signs of dying and you know you're ready to die, you enter that same experience of meditation and you intentionally dissolve what's residual of the physical body. And after three days into the dying process, 
the body will disappear. Now it's said that there's a subtle particulate matter of the body that doesn't disappear, but as seen by others, it will seem like the body disappears. So all that's left is the hair and nails, the inanimate substance of the body. But the bones of the rest of the body is completely gone. It's all changed into light. And what will float into space after three days is a spectacular display of rainbow lights circling in, 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 in the air. And that will last for several days or something, several weeks. That's called rainbow body. There's no physical body left. The second way of doing that, what's called the thoroughly cutting through practice way of doing a rainbow body is to, is to use the dakinis, which are the female and wisdom energy forms. And they know this practice well. The, the lineage holders hold the practice. So you act as if you're a dakini who knows how to do this practice. And it, it just get, you get out of your own way and you, you can improve the efficiency of this dissolving process by imagining that yourself as a dakini doing this process as you die. And then you can get achieve rainbow light much quicker than, say, three days. You can do it in a single day. That's the second process. The other two processes are what are called um, the forest fire approach and the awareness holders approach. The forest fire approach is a bypassing approach, a Turgel approach. And what you do in that is you you imagine that you you when you're dying you light the body on fire and it's like the body residual substantiality of the body is like fuel and it all burns up and quickly burns up and disappears and all that's left is bright light rainbow lights in the sky above where the body was that's called the forest fire approach and the fourth approach is uh you don't have to purify the residual substantiality of the body at all because if you take the view that the body was never anything other than pure, primarily pure right from the very beginning of this time. If you have that extra experience, you don't have to do anything. You can you can intend the, in the body in, in its original sacred form without any substantiality. It just appears rainbow light in the sky. So in the Nyingma tradition in Tibetan Buddhism, for example, there was a man named Garab Dorji who was the Indian master who was the head of the tradition and he had two students. One was Manju Sri Mitra, and the other was a man named Sri Simha, who was Prabhupada Sambhava's teacher. So, so when he was sickly and dying, and he said, I'm have to die now, he told Manju Sri Mitra was with him, he said, don't die, you haven't given me all the teachings yet. But he died and he transformed immediately into golden light in his form body and floated in the sky. And then he disappeared. And my Jesus said, I didn't finish all the teachings. What are you gonna, what are you gonna show me? I, I, I don't have the rest of the way. You have to give me this. So he appeared in, in a golden form, came back to him and he had a text made of golden light. And he handed him the text and he said, these are the three essential points of the rest of the teaching. It's called the Ninchik. And that was the what is passed on to lineage. It's been unpacked in great detail, but in, in Nyingma Dzogchen, that's the, the what he did. He, he he came back and gave him the teachings. So that's called great consciousness transference. And usually, when a master can just at will change into golden rainbow light, that's usually accompanied by song and prayer and fragrant smells and it's a whole light show and sensory show and great masters will do that kind of practice so those are the four ways of consciousness transference in this tradition and the underlying implication is as miller says there's no dying to be done people who never really die they live on and and they 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 become an enlightened master becomes awakened Dhammakaya space, which they become part of that infinite field of brilliantly knowing, awakened awareness, love. And they can operate out of what's called gongpa, enlightened intention. They can they can intend any to come into any plane of reality they want in, any, in multiple copies of themselves, and they can emanate and guide others along the path and help them out. And, 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 and they have, there's, there's no dying process. They become what are called the yungdrung, the, the immortal ones. That's true in Buddhism and it's also true in Taoism. So that's the overview of the practice in Poa.
And what I thought we'd do now is we're going to switch gears and go back to the Western model. So think about somebody who you've lost in your life that you feel unresolved about the loss. And you can settle into yourself and close your eyes and focus on this. And keep thinking about them in such a way that you can make a connection with them. In fact, you can think about them so vividly that you actually feel like they're a live presence in the room. Think about them that vividly. Bring them to mind so clearly. And keep thinking about the special connection you had with them. And now I'll bring you back to the circumstances of why this loss is unsettled for you still. What was it about the way that they died or the nature of the relationship that you feel the most emotionally unfinished about? And reflect now on what it is that you feel most emotionally unfinished about in this relationship. And imagine that person was right in front of you, present. Is if you open your eyes, you could actually sense their presence strongly. Go ahead and do that. And you can give voice, keep your thing muted, but give voice out loud if you're by yourself to whatever it is that you feel you need to most express it feels most emotionally unfinished about the relationship or about the way they died. Go ahead and do that now. Bring to mind what feels most emotionally unfinished about the relationship and allow yourself to give voice to that as if they could, in their state of mind currently, they could really understand what you're saying. It may be about the way they died it may be something about the loss. It may be something about the relationship. Bring to mind, and particularly what feels most emotionally unfinished, and bring to mind and say it in a heartfelt way. And see what else comes to mind that feels unfinished. And keep doing that until you start to feel something shifting. Give voice to whatever feels the most emotional and unfinished, including the feelings of that. It may be what you're angry about. It may be what you're sad about. There's something that feels unsettled that you never get a chance to talk about. And imagine you have this one last occasion to really give voice to this in a way that will help this settle. Giving voice to what feels most emotionally unfinished in a heartfelt way. And as there's some silence comes, just let stay with that. Stay with the connection you have with them. And then see, wait with yourself and see if anything else comes up that feels unfinished. And if you find there's more, Give voice to that too. Now imagine that that person in the ways that they know you so well, they have something they want you to know. They've seen how you've suffered over the years. They've seen that this hasn't really ended fully for you. 
they see that you haven't been able to fully get over this. And they have some things to tell you about that that will help you. So listen now to what they most want to say to you. And let yourself really take it in. They see what needs to happen here. Whatever the underlying thing that's unsettled, whatever the conflict may be, they're addressing that directly in terms of what you most need to hear. Now, see what else needs to be said on either side. Where there's more that you want to say, it feels still unsettled. Whether there's something that they want to say. Continue that process until it's something shifts, until you start to feel settled. Now it's time to take leave. Find a way of taking leave in the relationship. You can keep the memories of what you had. It seems so precious. But other than that, saying goodbye so you can go your separate ways on your journeys. Find a way of taking leave now. And then imagine yourself now at some time in the future when you've gone on with your life, settled with this grief has come to an end. And notice what's different about your life at that time in the future when you've settled with this grieving process. Imagine the scene in some detail about the ways you're going about your life and what's different about that. And then bring the process to a close. I'm going to count from one to five, and you can awaken yourself feeling settled with your experience. Five, four, three, two, one. Fully awake and settled with your experience. Now, this protocol has several steps in it. The first step is to make a connection with the person that you've lost. So you think about the nature of the relationship and you think about it intimately with the feelings. Now, many people will feel like that they can feel that closeness so much that the person is like present in the room. Early in the grieving process, 70% of people will feel like the person is a visitation to them, the person who's just died. So this is not uncommon. You can imagine the connection so vividly, it's like they're in the room. We call that the revivification part of it. You're making it vivid. Then the protocol begins with the invitation to bring to mind what feels most emotionally unfinished about the relationship. 
and the instructions are that specific. If you focus on what feels most emotionally unfinished and give voice to that, it becomes an occasion to finish it, to finish the processing of this so it, it settles down. That's why we word it in terms of what's most emotionally unfinished. And you say that they can give voice to it. Now, if I'm working on this one-on-one -on -one with somebody, not like in a group of 60 people, I'll ask you to give voice to it out loud so I can monitor the process. Sometimes people will talk about the circumstances of, of the dying process. Sometimes they'll talk about the loss of the relationship. But whatever it is that they're not fully have all the information they need in order to process this. So giving voice to what's most emotionally unfinished is a way of starting to process that again. For example, I, I was doing a tr psychology training workshop for three days and I had a senior psychologist take it. And in this first day, she didn't come back after the first day. And she called me two days later. And what she told me was that she and her husband had some difficulty with fertilization but they eventually had a child and they thought it was the only child they had and the child was 16 at the time and while she came to this workshop with me she got a call that night from the police that when he was driving home he crashed his car and it burned and he died so and she was suicidal after that this was her only chance to have a kid she put everything into this kid so I told her to come in and we did this grief protocol. And she first went over what was missing from how he died. And she thought that he might have reached over. It was a country road and it was a lot of trees and he wrapped his car around a tree and it burned rapidly. She thought he might have been putting in a CD and not paying attention to the road. She was meaning making about the nature of the dying. But one of the things she gave voice to was she said, you're drinking too much. And that was true. So she understood an explanation for this, which was quite plausible. But then she wanted to die and she was suicidal. In the second part, the third part of the protocol, the first is the revivification. The second is giving voice to what feels most emotional and finished. And she said, you can't leave me. I'm, you know, I, you're the only thing I have in my life outside of her husband. So she gave voice to that concern. In the next part, you, you let him give voice to what he knows about her. That's a metaphor for unhooking the conflict. It was... Freud and his contemporary Carl Abraham who said that complicated bereavement is necessarily always about conflict in the relationship. You've got to get at the conflict. And the way you, best way you get at the conflict in this protocol is by getting the, that person to give voice to what the conflict is rather than the person giving voice to it. It comes through the metaphor of the other. They know the conflict. They can see it more better. And what, she, what, what he said to her was the following, Ma, get a life. You were in my face all the time growing up, especially when I was an adolescent. And now you want to kill yourself and follow me? And get in my face again? Stay alive and give or get a life. Now, she knew that. But the point was that he had to say it that vividly. And once he could say that more vividly, that resolved the conflict sufficiently that she could go on with her life. And the conflict got unhooked. The next part of the protocol is leave taking. You can keep the memories. But you can't keep the relationship because that's complicated bereavement. That's delaying the bereavement. So it forces the issue of making the difference between the memories and the actual saying goodbye and leave taking. 
And then the last part of the protocol is you imagine some indefinite time in the future when the person has finished the grieving process and they see what their life is like and they can get on with their life again beyond this grieving process. It's a very powerful protocol. It was originally developed in 1989 by Manthorpe in Australia. We've used it a lot. It uh, rarely ever does not not work. So it's very powerful. So it's the best of what I found in grieving in the West. Now, you mentioned, Cody, the pandemic. And that's something it's, we're, we're, we don't have funerals anymore because of the social distancing. And a lot of times people in nursing homes are just pile them in trucks now. It's not even a funeral, there's no burial service. So it's, it's become a, a cultural problem with almost 200,000 people dying. So as a culture, it's important to address this. And one of the ways of doing it is to imagine the persons who've died all releasing their indestructible essences and wandering on their journey. And if you put the intention of your own mind into guiding them along the path, it will soften their fear. A lot of people who die of COVID, they can't breathe. That's how they die. That's terrifying. You comfort them. You can do a visualization for all the people who've died of COVID and comfort them. And that intention of your own mind affects everybody else in the field. In Tibetan Buddhism, unlike mindfulness, you open what's I'll call simultaneous mind. You open up a level of mind that's beyond ordinary time and beyond the limits of space. And in that infinite, timeless, boundless field, everything is contained within that field. Once you open up what we call simultaneous mind, it changes your ethics because you can't think or do anything that doesn't have an effect on everybody else in the field. That's where the bodhisattva vows come in. That you recognize that you don't live in a vacuum. And if you want to affect the, everybody in the field, particularly those who have died of COVID, then you intentionally soothe them and send them on their journey with less fear. It's a very powerful visualization, which I often do with my, my students during this COVID time. But I wanted to leave a time for question and answers. I've presented you a lot of stuff, both East and West in terms of how we look at this, but it, I'd like to learn a little bit more about what your own experience was with the grief protocol. Well, let's, um, let's do that Stoa style. And uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and uh, we'll call on you and, and get you unmuted and you can ask. And if you don't uh, feel comfortable asking, um, just write that and we can, uh, I can say it. And thank you, Dan. That was, that was awesome. Thank you. You want to speak more to that, Manus? Yeah, I haven't experienced um, anybody close to me that have that have died like family or friends, but <clears throat> really stuck with this addiction of playing computer games a lot. And I actually use this as a way to grieve letting go of that. And it felt to me just as powerful and intimate and visceral as, I don't know what I would imagine it is. It's a novel application for it. <laughs> yeah. 
It's just an observation or really it's, a question. It's creative. Question. It's creative. Thank you for sharing that. What 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 did the computer give, games give voice to? When you when you had the computer games give voice to what they they want they want to say what they did to unhook the conflict. It's a little bit difficult to remember the during the intense emotions, but the gist of it is, uh, it's like um, you know when you go through tough times, um, and it's always been a comfort, you know, a comforter, always been been there for me and this idea of not judging it as a bad thing but just letting it be what it was that comfort and for it to be for me to it's it's like a projection of myself like a mirror of myself that i was facing and talking to and it was like he was saying it was actually preparing me for what comes next and um I don't have to fear the lack of it going forward with the challenges and the suffering and the pain that might be ahead and how to deal with it. Like they were other things. It's honest. Sorry. I said, that's honest. Yeah. Emmanuel, you had some feedback. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, thank you. I use the greeting protocol to say, say, <laughs> say goodbye to my sister. She's still living, but um, our, our relationship needs to be let go of. So I tapped into it really strong. And um, I, I love what Manus just said about like addictions because there's something about my intimate family relationships that goes together with the food addiction I've been battling for like 10 years. So I feel very raw, um, very like tapped in all the way down my chakras. Um, but it feels good because I, I feel like I'm being honest with myself right now. There's always- what, is, what does she have to say to you? She had to say, um, It's okay. I'm like crying face. She got to say that we're not equipped to be family for each other. But that doesn't mean I can't have family. It's just not her. And, and that's, that's acceptable to me. So it shifted. Yeah. And, as painful as it is, it shifted. And, and I, I know that we envisioned being some kind of sister archetype to each other, and we've tried so much, and it, it's just not working. Um, but that's all right. You got to the heart of the matter. It feels different now, doesn't it? Even though it's painful. It's really painful, but it's not insurmountable. And... Uh, I'm gonna play with this when my freaking food addiction comes up again. Like, I'm just, just right on the verge of like demigoddess mastery. <laughs> it's just a little awkward finishing touches right now. But um, I'm into it and I, I thank you for everything you shared today. This is what we hope for. It, 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 it unhooks the conflict. And as painful as it may be, it's shifted. Anybody else? A question from Katie. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask about karmic memory traces? Sure. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi, Daniel. Thank you. This was great. Um, I'm finding myself very intrigued by the phrase karmic memory trace, and I'd love to learn more about that. Like, what, what are they, um, how they arise, and what non-engagement with them means? It means you set up the view of this infinite expanse of awakened awareness and everything arises within that field. And as it arises, you don't engage it. You just let it be there in awareness. When you engage it, 
you form a karmic memory trace. Those karmic memory traces become part of what's called the storehouse mind. And they get activated. And they, they once they get activated, they, the Tibetan word is minwa, they ripen. And they come out in the form of influencing your state of mind and the content of your mind in subtle ways, more obvious ways. And eventually they influence your behavior. So most of the content of your mind is the ripening of karmic memory traces. All the junk of the mind is the ripening of karmic memory traces. And you build it up over lifetimes. That's called a kunchi namse, the storehouse consciousness in Tibetan. So these practices allow you to set up a view where you take the infinite vast expanse in the right way, let everything arise within it without engaging anything, but it, it, with pure awareness of it. And if you don't engage it as it comes up, it's like writing on water. It immediately disappears. And then another one comes up and it becomes an automatic process of release. The average time it takes about seven or eight years to do that process. If you combine it with inner fire practice when you're working with the central channel system and resolving the substantiality, residual substantiality of the body, if you combine it with the what I call the turgay, the bypassing visions, then you can clean this up in about two years. If you do all three of those practices as a set, you can finish everything in about three years. So we have now of our long-term students, we have about 30 students who are pretty far along with this process. And we're it's hard to run subjects now. We're waiting for the lab to open again. But we identified the subjects and we've interviewed them. And now when the lab opens, Judd Brewer at, at Brown University will run the subjects and we'll look at the what neurocircuitry of the complete purification and flourishing of positive states, which I think has profound implications for mental health. So that's what, it's a very specific practice. It's a very, very advanced practice. But in these lineage traditions, there are very specific instructions that are given. And I've done this for 50 years. So I, I've learned them along the way. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, sort of. I, I feel like there's a there's an interesting point where I'm getting stuck on like engaging with karmic memory traces versus like engaging with the world. And it seems like it would be possible to be completely unengaged with the world and in like a dark cave somewhere, but still engaging with all of your, you know, psychological but, but stuff. But we don't do that in these traditions. Yeah. The, but the, 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 true, opposite, the true expression like, of the authenticity of realization is conduct. And so that's where I'm sort of, I'm wondering about like engaging with the world from a place of non-engagement with karmic memory traces. Exactly. Yeah. Then you can truly serve people because you don't get in your own way. But the true measure of, if, if people get a taste of awakening, how do we know it's authentic? It may be just purely conceptual. We say if it moves your heart, it's accompanied by gratitude and appreciation, then it's likely to be authentic. But the only true test of it is conduct. People who are realized they leave a wake of positive influence around them. It affects their life, everything in their life and everybody around them. That's what we look for in terms of the genuineness of this practice. So it's not like you go off in a cave and do that by yourself. It's not, that's not how it's done. Thank you. Um, Isaiah, uh... You have a good question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel and Cody, for this event. Um, just a bit of, of context. My question, uh, my family went through a lot of tragedy in 2019 um, due to the various deaths. And I, for geographical reasons, I haven't been able to see them since that. And so I'm wondering if any specific training is necessary to guide people through the grieving protocol, or if it should be guided specifically by a, a trained professional. It should be done by a clinician. Okay. Where's, where's your family? 
uh, in Mexico. Well, they speak English? <laughs> uh, no. <clears throat> That's why I was, when we were going through this, I was like trying to translate all your things into Spanish directly, but I mean. Yeah, I got to see if I can find somebody for you yeah. that speaks Spanish and knows the Greek protocol. Uh, if you don't mind, Daniel, I'll connect um, you and Isaiah um, and see if we can uh, yeah. have a follow-up connection for that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Key um, has a question. She says, thank you so much for inviting Daniel. Um, oh, uh, you spoke of, uh, Daniel, you spoke of three internal POAs. Uh, can you clarify the third one, the rebirth one of content? Well, the first one, there's no content. It's just pure field of awareness, which we always fall unconscious in. But if you are recognized that as a lucid, bright field of awakened awareness, then that game over. The second one is the sound and light show. And you have to see the, the lights as insubstantial, not, not as, as real and out there. And the third one, mental content comes back, but it starts with the experience of what we call a mental body. That you have your senses back. You can now see people who are still part of the world. You've left the world, but you can see them. You can hear them, but they don't respond to you. And, and if you think about going someplace, you're immediately there. Whoosh, you're immediately there. So you figure out from that that this mental body has lost the physical body and that you've, you, you infer from that that you've died. And then you'll get a series of visions about what world you're gonna end up in. And if you can see those visions as empty constructions of mind, then you can get off the wheel. But the tendency is you get caught up in all that stuff and you end up getting reborn again Start, starting the whole thing over again, like Groundhog Day. So that's what I was saying. Key, how is that? Um, it made sense, but Groundhog Day, you know, I haven't seen that movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, one of the classics yeah I, I figured um so how how does one get out of groundhog day i guess is the question in tibetan buddhism you see everything as empty which means that it's you see everything as a mental construction of mind we tend to make the world solid we tend to make it as if it's out there. And that's a view that's reinforced by science as if there's a world out there and we measure constancies in that world. But Buddhism, what if that world is just all mental constructions? What if we're seeing it our own mental constructions? And that's the view that's taken. So if you, if you see them as mental constructions, you can go beyond the mental constructions so they don't interfere. But we get caught up in the mental constructions of our mind. We dwell in them. We get caught up in them. There's a, a, a heart sutra. It goes like this in Sanskrit. Gate, gate, parada gate, parada sam gate, bodhisvaha. There's your entire path literally means gone, gone, gone way beyond, gone way, way beyond. Ooh, what a realization. That's the exact translation from the Sanskrit. This is what it means. In our everyday life, we get so caught up in thought. We spend most of our day caught up in thought. We tend to take thought as real. We forget that it's a mental construction. But if I look at it a certain way, I see the thought as just a mental construction. And I start operating out of, not the thought, I don't get caught up in it so much. I start operating out of the field of awareness, cleaned up of thought. It's the first gate, awareness gone beyond thought. But I get caught up in my sense of self. I get caught up in Danness. 
a lot of the day, I operate out of self mode. But if I do emptiness of self, I see beyond that self, and now I operate on a field of awareness that's not only cleaned up of thought, but it's cleaned up of sense of self. That's the second gate. Awareness itself is my basis of operation, gone beyond personal identity. But I, now I get caught up in time. I tend to take the time and it's real, and space is real. But if I look at it, the field as a, a, a field of timeless, limitless, boundless awareness. I go beyond the construction of time. Now I'm operating out of that timeless field of awareness, which is huge, and limitless, and changeless. But I still tend to localize consciousness within that. And when I sh set up the view a certain way, I can shift out of that localization and become that unbounded wholeness. That's the point that I open up to awakening. That's a big shift. So what the mantra means is, I get caught up in thought, I go beyond thought. I get caught up in self, I go beyond self. I get caught up in time and space, I go beyond time and space. I get caught up in localization of consciousness, I go beyond that. And now I'm operating out of this limitless, huge, boundless field of timeless, lucidly bright, awakened awareness love. That's my true nature. I found my way home. So we say that emptiness is the path because as long as I see everything is substantial and out there, I don't ever look at it this way. But once I open up to viewing it from this perspective, I can go beyond all those seemingly substantial structures of the mind and all the reactivity involved in that and I'm genuinely free of all that. So it's to find the way out or if you like the way home. That's what these paths are about. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Kay. Um, got a, maybe time for one or two more. Um, Jacob, you have a question? You want to unmute yourself? How do you know nobody dies? You have to go through the dying process and stay awake during it. Then you know. So it's experience is your source. Of what? So your experience is your source. Yes. Thank you. Then you can come back in any form you want. I just call bullshit on you all over the place because you're talking about no, it makes me angry because this is very misleading and very powerful stuff that you're saying. It's powerfully misleading. You're talking about releasing yourself from mental constructs, but everything you just talked about was constructive. So, all I can do is describe you're, the way you're out. You're glaringly hypocritical. Thank you. Can't please everybody. Um, thank you. Tanya, you have a question? So Daniel, thank you for your presentation. Um, you had presented to us two starkly different contrasting ways to see dying. Yeah, they're I was different. wondering if th the populations in the East view dying differently as a result than those of us in the West. Like, and there's a, there's a fundamental difference in, in, in seeing dying in, in the populations. I don't know about that. All I know is the people who practice or how they see it. But whether people who don't practice see it that way, I don't know that. Um, next up, uh, Max, um, you had some feelings. Do you want to talk about, uh, talk about your feels?
Ah, can't use your mic. Um, and it's night there. Well, thank you. Um, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're feeling things. Um, let's see. Next up. Uh, let's see. Time. Okay. Ryan. Hi. Thanks so much, Daniel, for coming and talking to us. This was a great presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, thanks, Cody, for facilitating. Uh, I work as a hospice nurse in an in inpatient setting. Um, so I'm around death and dying quite a bit and wondering how to maybe incorporate, maybe not necessarily the clinical practice, but some of the concepts and ideas that you're using to facilitate death and dying in a better way or a mo more holistic way here in the West. Thanks. Well, the best preparation for dying is the experience of awakening in practice, because then you use the dying process to awaken. That's the best practice. Short of that, then as people who are still alive and not going through the dying process, we can still keep people in a better state of mind when they're going through the dying process. As they dismantle thought and they dismantle perception, then there are a couple of things you want to do about that. There's a point where in, in the Western literature on dying, where people sort of get it that they're dying and they want to turn inward. That's a point that we often don't recognize in the hospice process. You know probably what I'm talking about. And, and at that point, families and doctors interfere. The person wants to just prepare to die now. They know that they're, that they're giving up hope of living. And we should facilitate helping them die at that point and recognize those signs and let the family members let them go. But oftentimes we either, family members will, for their own needs, will continue to push push the issue or doctors will try and involve them in life-saving things that will interfere with the process. At that point, we should let them go and we should pre prepare them to die. Now, how to prepare them to die is to comfort them, to remove the fear and uncertainty. If you can go through what they're likely to experience as they are in the dying process, that's useful. My first root lama in the 1970s, he, he did something unusual. When he died, he let us be with him. And he gave us a running commentary on what he was doing up to the point he couldn't talk anymore. And then before he got to the point of not talking anymore, he told us what was going to come next. He gave us all the previews. So that's the teacher's greatest teaching is to teach others how to die. So you can do a lot in your hospice work. It's a whole world that opens up there. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Is that all right? um, I'm just curious if how you see the evolution of death and dying um, as as culture changes and um, yeah, just the evolution of death and dying in the West, maybe in relation to some of the teachings. Well, I'm a Baba was the great master in Buddhism. And he wrote texts for the future, what are called secret treasure texts. One of them was discovered in the 14th century, it was by Karolingpa. He left it behind. About half of them had been discovered. And that one contained all the teachings on the what you know is the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And what he foresaw is that at times in history, people would get weirded out about dying and they couldn't talk about it. So they needed teachings on it. So that those teachings were made available. We know what the experience of the stages of dying are. They're described in great detail. There's a manual for how you go through the dying process. It's described in terms of how each element dissolves into the next element. 
but what the experiences are that go along with that. That's the internal consciousness transference practice that I, 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 I went over. That's available in a book called, that we translated called, The Self-Arising Threefold Embodiment of Enlightenment. It's a collection of all the advanced cave and hermitage yogi texts in one, one, one collection. So there's a whole detailed description of the, how you use the dying process. I think we may have time for just one more. Um, Vicente? Pronounce it right. Yep. Hi, Dan. Thanks, thanks for your time, um, and Cody and team for organizing. Um, just a quick question about possibly a more detailed uh, explanation of the, the consciousness transference process. So, for example, during the dying process of the 13th Dalai Lama, like, for example, how would that go from point A, 13th Dalai Lama, to point B, like, the current Dalai Lama, like which POA is their intention behind it and so forth. Well, the trouble with that is it gets politicized, but um, what, what will happen is if he decides to come back, he will leave his body, enter awakened Dharmakaya space, and then put the intention into coming back in a certain form. But a great master can come back in any form that they want. They can come back in multiple forms. It's, it's on what we call gongbar, enlightened intention. So they can make the determination of where they want to come back. Rahab Tulku, who was my roommate, he was the emanation of Parmasambhava. And he came in the 14th century reincarnated every every lifetime at the same geographic area so he could continue to teach them. But he said that he's not going to continue that there. He's going to come back in the West now. So how he shows up, what form he'll show up, I don't know anything about that yet because he died earlier this year. So it's too early yet. But he's going to continue in the West. So the process of how one selects a great master, that's difficult because it's often political, politicized. I'll tell you a story about that. I, I, I met a Lama once who told me a story of when the, the Chinese were going to invade Tibet. The Panchen Lama, who was an advisor to the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama was a teenager at the time. They said, we need to go to Beijing and talk directly with Mao and negotiate a peaceful settlement. There's no reason to have our country destroyed. So they went on a trip. And the Lama that I know, three days on the trip, had a prophetic dream that they were going to be ambushed. And he told the Dalai Lama, this is a trap. You have to leave. So he disguised him and took him back on a donkey. And the Panchen Lama went on with the journey. And there was an ambush and he was placed in the house arrest in Beijing for the rest of his life. He then died and came back as a young kid in China. And both the Dalai Lama's tradition and the Chinese agreed that this was the real Panchen Lama. And he was educated by the Chinese. When he was eight years old, not still remembering his former lifetimes, he escaped China by himself as an eight-year-old boy, got out of the country and showed up at the Dalai Lama's palace and sent him back. That's never been disclosed by the Chinese because they put in a fake one and they're going to say that they, they had the real Panchen Lama. But the Panchen Lama's back. No one knows where he is so he doesn't get killed. But it takes the politicization out of this process. So there'll be a new Dalai Lama at some point, but he's publicly saying he's not going to come back. He just want to get into this cat fight with the Chinese about it. Dan, there is, um, I know we have only a couple more minutes, um, but there is this one, uh, there's kind of a call for, call for a question to, um, 
to address some of the epistemological concerns revol revolving uh, Jacob, who you know had his uh, had his own skepticality about um, uh, these teachings in general. And if there's any anything you'd like to say to it, or can say to it, to appease um, appease minds. Well, all I can do is tell you about my experiences over 50 years of doing this practice. If he thinks it's all fake news and, and, and he's angry about that, there's nothing I can do about that state of mind. All I can do is talk what I know. Um, I think that's going to put us right at about time. Um, Daniel, I want to thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for doing this. This was a uh, this is really fantastic, and I think a lot of people got a, a lot of beautiful, uh, beautiful experiences out of it. Um, you want to say any last uh, any last words or anything else? I'm gonna I'm gonna post your um, web website pointingoutway.org into the chat if people would like to learn some more about Daniel. Um, anything last you'd like to say before I hand it to Peter to close us off? No, just be sensitive to all the people who are dying in this pandemic. I think that Thank you. we don't have leadership that's sensitive to that at the moment. We need to be careful about all the people who are dying and not let them live, die insignificantly. Thank you again, we Daniel. Forgot. Okay. Good. Thank you so Bye much. everybody. Uh, Peter, would you like to close us out? Yeah. Uh, Thank you, uh, Cody, for emceeing today. Thank you, Daniel. A lot of rawness was expressed today. And uh, if you want to process it together as a group, you can head over to our uh, Discord channel. Uh, there's a few, if you're familiar with Discord, there's like a video option. So you just have to go there, go to the rules channel, give it a thumbs up, and all the other channels will open up for you. So you can continue this conversation and maybe what arose, process a lot of things uh, there. Uh, to talk about uh, some upcoming events uh, tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Daniel Schmachtenberger, Sense Making Mensch, is coming in um, to do a session on Dharma Inquiry. He has a series of questions, excellent questions, to kind of flesh out our, what, what one's Dharma is in life. Uh, so that's tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And then on Tuesday, Sarah Ness, um, who is... Uh, sort of like the epicenter of all this authentic relating uh, uh, kind of movement scene. She has something called Quarantine and Community and Exploration. Uh, and that's September 1st, Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we have many, many events on the website. Uh, you can check it out. And, um, you know, if you'd like to support the STOA, if you like this session, if you'd like more sessions like this, you can go to our Patreon page, uh, which is in the, the chat. So again, um, and, and Emmanuel, the STOA is lit. It is lit. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.